Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today's topic is uh, from the same chapter, that is the fungal infections. And today's topic is candidiasis, moniliasis, or thrush. The definition and nomenclature. Candidiosis is an infection which is caused by yeast of the genus Candida. It's a superficial infection of mucous membranes and skin and is numerically most important, but deep invasive disease such as septicemia, endocarditis, and meningitis may also occur. Candida albicans is an oval yeast, two to six to three to nine micrometer in size and produced by budding cells, pseudo hyphes, and true hyphes, which are produced during the process of tissue invasion. This ability to spontaneously display several morphological forms is called as the polymorphism. Apart from Candida albicans, the genus Candida include over 100 species, most of which are neither commensals nor parasites on the humans. So the most important of the East is Candida albicans. Canada albicans is frequent, but not invariable, normal commensal of GI tract. Colonization with Canada albicans or another species may occur during birth directly from birth canal. The literature on oral carriage rate is extensive and fewer than 26% of normal subjects carry yeast in the mouth and the Candida albicans carriage is about 18%. If oral antibiotics effective against the residual GI tract bacterial flora are given, the candidal carrier rate rises. The percentage of vaginal carrier is of 12.7% for the Candida albicans. Higher rates of Candida carriage is found in the hospital patients even without the vaginal disease. Pregnancy, oral contraceptives and use of intrauterine devices have all been associated with elevated carrier rates. Generally, neither Candida albicans nor any other species of Candida is a permanent member of normal flora of the skin. Although transient colonization can occur in the neonatal period, particularly the skin adjacent to the body orifices. So although Canada albican is a usual carrier in GI tract and mouth, it is not a usual carrier on the skin surface. Canada may be persistent colonizer of the moist intratiginous sites in individuals as well as subungual spaces in patients with pre existing nail disease. Canada albicans can occasionally be cultured from the environment, usually in the vicinity of heavily infected subjects. Studies view that most infections are endogenous, and generally, infections follow a shift in the existing host yeast relationship. This shift from commensal to parasite results from a variety of influences. So strains carried by patients may be replaced by other way with different biological characteristics. These techniques can now be used to determine the important issues such as acquisition of drug resistance. The Candida albicans may also demonstrate an unusual phenomena, which is known as the phenotypic switching, whereby strains may change morphology to another phenotypic character, such as the drug sensitivity in response to change in growth conditions. So phenotypic switching can result in Candida resistance. Pathophysiology. 
factors such as production of a secreted aspartyl protease by certain strains of Canada albicans are known to affect the pathogenicity. The proteinase negative strains are known to be less virulent. In oral and cutaneous candidiasis, scraping examined microscopically usually show Canada in both budding and mycelial forms. In histopathology of invasive candidiosis, hyphae are present. This suggests that production of hyphae may contribute to fungal virulence, the point I told uh, before as well. The ability to yeast form to adhere to the underlying epithelial cell is an important pre uh, prequel for the tissue invasion. The best studies adhesions are known as the agglutinin-like sequence or ALS proteins. The candida's ability to form a biofilm on certain surface may lead to virulence or the drug resistance. Host factors. The elderly, the very young and ill patients are susceptible to oral thrush, we all know. In the mouth, carbohydrate levels are important. So the food debris likely to present in the mouth of severely ill patients with inadequate oral hygiene and a diabetic saliva also predisposed to oral thrush infection. People with diabetes are more susceptible to candidosis. Phagocytosis is also impaired in patients with diabetes. Any form of local tissue damage may be important in pathogenesis of candidosis. Candida paronychia is more common in people with psoriasis. Some patients with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis has had iron deficiency and with iron replacement, their resistance to Candida infection reduces, uh, increases. Canada can interact directly with immune cells such as regulatory T cells. Apart from diabetes, a variety of endocrinopathies have been mentioned as susceptible factor for candidosis. For example, Cushing syndrome, familial endocrinopathy presenting with Edison's disease, hypoparathyroidism, and hypothyroidism. Immunological factors. Both superficial and deep-seated cell-mediated immunity is of paramount importance in countering candidosis, coupled with phagocytosis and killing by polymorphs and macrophages. Circulating antibodies or secretory IgA may have some role. The induction of interleukins, such as interleukin 12, 23, 27, and 35 are key steps in host defense. The susceptibility of elderly and severely ill people, especially those with leukemias, lymphomas, or carcinomatosis, probably lies in large measure in depression of cell-mediated immunity. Patients with defective T lymphocyte functions, such as those with AIDS, appear to be particularly susceptible to mucosal or cutaneous candidiasis, but not systemic infection. By contrast, in patients with chronic mucocutaneous candidiosis, candidosis, the most consistent abnormality have been those of T lymphocyte function, particularly the cytokine expression. And patients with defective neutrophil and macrophage functions are susceptible to both superficial and systemic candidosis. In addition, Cytokines such as interferon gamma appear to interact with these cells to enhance the killing of organisms. It appears that there is therefore substantial interplay between different immune mechanisms in defense, including the epidermal express peptides, such as defense in against candidosis.
the candidosis and HIV or AIDS. In untreated HIV positive population, oral candida carriage rate are generally high. The colonization rates are higher in intravenous drug abusers and in those with lymphopenia. In addition, patients with CD4 cell depletion and those with elevated beta-2 microglobulin levels are more likely to be carriers. Oral thrush does appear to reflect the viral load. Both hairy, cell leukemia, both hairy leukoplakia and oral candidiosis are markers for increased rate of progression to AIDS. And the presence of oral candidosis may have implications in survival in some patients. The evidence that persistent vag vaginal candidosis is associated with AIDS is less convincing. Identification. At 37 degrees centigrade, on media free of cyclohexamide, colonies from swabs and skin samples usually appear within one to three days. However, growth from thicker skin and nail material can be slower, so plates be held for a week before reporting it as negative. On albicans ID agar, colonies of Candida albicans are blue and all other yeast are cream or white. On chrome agar, colonies of Canada albicans, Canada tropicalis, and cruci are green, blue, and pink, respectively. So, Canada albicans, the habitat, morphology, cultural characteristics. So, this is how the colonies of Canada albicans look like in uh, subroad agar without cyclohexidum, without cyclohexamide. And uh, if we do microscopy, you can see the yeast, uh, budding yeast and pseudohyphae. In addition, you can also see the blastospores and chlamydospores. These spores are both formed. The blastospores are the budding uh, spores and chlamydospores are the, again, developed from the pseudohyphae. So this is how the Canada will look on chrome agar. The Canada albican colony will be green, Canada tropicalis colonies will be blue, and Canada crucii colony will be pink. Histology. The fungal elements are almost always restricted to the outer layers of epithelium, including stratum corneum. On the skin, particularly in acute infections, Mycelium may be very sparse, and indeed, yeast swamp may be present in only small numbers. Acute oral candidosis, the inflammatory infiltrate, consists predominantly of polymorphs, which form microabscesses or subcorneal pustules. The splitting of epidermis often follows. In the dermis, the inflammatory infiltrate is a mixture of lymphocytes, plasma cells, especially in mouth and histocytes. In chronic cutaneous candidiasis, hyperkeratosis with acanthosis may be seen, and in candida granuloma of the skin, dense mixed cells infiltrate, including the giant cells are seen. So this is, this uh, picture shows marked acanthosis of the epidermis, and superficial layers of epithelium are infiltrated by large number of neutrophils forming neutrophilic abscesses. If we do a PA stain, you can see the yeast budding and, pseudo and budding forms as well as pseudohyphenes. Management. The general principles of management of candidosis is in mouth, involves frequent toileting in seriously ill with denture hygiene in other patients. If Canada is infecting the skin, then careful drying of the affected site is important. In many cases, topical antifungal alone is sufficient, but in immunocompromised patients with oropharyngeal candidosis, oral systemic therapy may be necessary. 
apart from chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis and onychomycosis, the main indicators of systemic anti-candidal therapy and candid are candidal septicemia and deep-seated candidosis. Combination of antiretroviral therapy in patient with AIDS with antifungal therapy improves the outcome significantly. Therapeutic agents. The polyene antibiotics, amphotericin and nistatin are effective against the Canada species and most other yeast pathogens. Even though polyenes are used over many years, the resistance by Canada albican or other Canada species to these antibiotics is very rare. They are all safe to use topically and contact dermatitis is a rare side effect. The gastrointestinal absorption of all polyenes antibiotic is limited after oral administration and only 5 to 10 percent is taken up. Of these drugs, only amphotericin must be given by intravenous infusion. There are liposomal formulations like embisome and lipid complex like abelset. abelset. The other important group of agents which are effective against Canada is imidazole. Clotrimazole, myconazole, econazole are best known in topical use and significant resistance to them has not developed in Canada species. Usually the terbenafines are not effective in candidiasis and must not be given either in oral form or in topical formulation. The most useful oral treatment are the two triazoles, fluconazole and itraconazole. The usual daily dose of itraconazole is 100 to 200 milligram and fluconazole is 100 to 400 milligram for a minimum of two weeks. Other azoles include voriconazole and posaconazole. Both have been used for severe oropharyngeal and esophageal infection. In addition, other antifungals like caspofungin and enidolomycin, intravenous fungal cell wall inhibitors may be used in systemic disease. Flucytosine is an agent that is absorbed from the gut and is relatively safe and very potent against those strains of Canada which retain their sensitivity. Unfortunately, resistance developed during treatment and drug is now only occasionally used for candidiosis. candidosis. The first line treatment in infants is suspension of nistatin, amphotericin or myconazole gel applied several times. In adult patients, removal of dentures with careful hygiene at night is important. Amphotericin or nistatin lozenges, oral nistatin suspension or myconazole muco uh, mucoadhesive tablets are effective in non-immunocompromised patients and duration of treatment varies from 10 to 14 days. For treatment of unresponsive and chronic cases, such as those with hyperplastic candidosis, either fluconazole 100 to 200 mg per day or itraconazole of 100 or 200 mg per day are more effective. A solution of itraconazole is an alternate to the capsule. Voriconazole or posaconazole are alternatives. Angular stomatitis usually respond to treatment with treatment of primary oral conditions, although topical antifungal applied to the area speed the recovery. Now we will discuss candidosis of specific site. So first the candidosis of the oral mucous membrane. Apart from the systemic steroid therapy, Local application of steroids in form of steroid cream, steroid mouthwashes or lozenges for the treatment of apthosis or lycanthinus of mouth or steroid aerosol given for asthma predisposed to oral candidosis. The candida can secondary invade other oral conditions such as ulcerative lycanthinus, pemphigus vulgaris, leukokeratosis and white sponge nevus. On the lips, invasion of traumatic chelitis may be a complication. 
In all cases, remo removal of candida often speeds the recovery of underlying disease, even though yeast is only a contributory cause. The acute pseudomembranous candidosis. The most common presentation of oral candidosis. The characteristic sign of the condition is a sharply defined patch of creamy, crumbly, curd-like white pseudomembrane, which when removed leaves, uh, leaves an underlying erythematous base. The pseudomembrane consists of deestimated epithelial cells, fibrin, leukocytes, and a mycelial fungal mycelium. It occurs most commonly in the first week of life and the preterm infants are especially susceptible. Apart from the neonate, it is usually secondary to local or generalized predisposing factor, notably neutropenia and those with HIV. There can be one or many patches. Buccal epithelium on cheek, gum and palate may be affected. Erosion and ulcerations are occasional complications. Oral candidosis is the most common secondary infection in those with HIV AIDS and recurrent or more prolonged episodes are expected in such patients. So this is how the acute pseudomembranous candidiasis look like. You can see the white curd-like pseudomembrane. If you remove, try to remove the pseudomembrane by tongue depressor, you will find red raw erosive areas. Then acute erythematous candidosis or acute atrophic oral candidosis, candidiasis. In this condition, there is marked soreness and denuded atrophic erythematous mucous membranes, particularly on the dorsum of the tongue. It may follow pseudomembranous candidosis with traces of residual membrane it is especially associated with antibacterial antibiotic therapy, but may also develop in HIV positive subjects and patients taking inhaled steroids. And all cases tongue is markedly affected. You can see loss of dumb and tongue papillae and totally raw and beefy tongue. Then chronic pseudomembranous candidosis. It does not differ clinically from acute pseudomembranous variety, but as the name suggests, the lesions are very persistent and occur mainly in immunocompromised patients. Then chronic erythematous candidosis, a soreness of epithelium in denture bearing area is said to affect nearly one quarter of all the denture wearer, wearers and most if not all cases appear to be caused by candidosis. A similar problem may also occur in children wearing orthodontic appliances. The condition is normally confined to the upper denture bearing area, palate and gums. The affected mucous membranes show variable bright red or dusky erythema, fairly sharply defined at the margins of the denture. There is often an associated angular chelitis. The vast majority of patients of either sex or otherwise fit. So this, this is a chronic erythematous candidosis. Then comes the chronic hyperplastic candidosis. A very persistent, firm, irregular, white plaques occurring in mouth, commonly on cheek and tongue. Most patients are male, generally over 30, and predisposing factor is not present usually. Although, particularly in extensive form, may occur in patients with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Smokers appear to be particularly prone. Around the hyperplastic area, there are margin of erythema, but unlike the pseudomembrane of oral thrush, this plaque cannot be easily removed. The significance of the condition lies in the fact then it must be differentiated from the leukoplakia, which is pre-malignant, and eventually it clears with a prolonged anti candida therapy. This is how chronic hyperplastic candidosis will look like. Then another condition, which is chronic nodular candidosis. 
a rare form of oral candidosis where there are nodules and cobalt appearance of the tongue. It is most often seen in certain patients with chronic mucocutaneous candidosis. Angular chelitis of perleash. Soreness at the angle of mouth extending towards the fold of facial skin is a well-known syndrome and it is not always associated with Canada infections. It is perhaps best considered as an intertrigo in which different organisms play a role, in which Canada has the most important role. Nutrition status and mechanical factors, for example, depth of the fold, the presence of moisture from the persistent salivation or licking of the lips are also important. There is always a long history of soreness and cracking of the lips. This is how the angular chelitis will look like. Median rhomboid glossitis. Acquired condition, characterized by more or less diamond shape, area on the dorsum of tongue with loss of pattern. Current opinions suggest that it is simply a variant of chronic plaque-like candidosis. Then candidosis of the body folds. Any skin fold may be affected, particularly in obese subjects. Signs are typically of erythema and a little moist exudation starting deep in the fold. As the condition develops, it spreads beyond the area of contact with fringed irregular edge and subcorneal pustules rupturing to give tiny erosions. Satellite lesions, pustular or papular lesions are classic. Soreness and itching which may on occasion be intense is usual. Topical steroid prescribed for relief of the later symptoms may modify the inflammatory sign and cause diagnostic confusion. So typically the candidiasis of body fold is moist and red and glistening and it will have the fringed border and satellite vesicles and pustules. So the satellite lesions uh, are quite typical of candidal infection. This is the point of differentiation between flexural psoriasis and candidiasis. So these are the intertegions characterized by development of pustules at the margin, satellite pustules rather. The web space candidosis. Where the web spaces of toes and fingers are affected, marked maceration with thick, white, horny layer is usually prominent. In cases of hand, some abnormality include wide, pad fingers appear to predispose to the infection. This is often known as erosive interdigitalis blastomycetia. Canada and gram-negative bacteria are often co-pathogen of this pathology. Similar interdigital infection of feet may occur in very hot climates, particularly those with heavy footwear, for example, the army personnel. Apart from the skin folds, maceration of the skin under the rings, dressings, may become infected with candida. This is how erosio interdigital blastomycetica looks like. The interdigital infection of the toe of the finger webs. Differential diagnosis of candidal intertrigo is tenia, seborrheic dermatitis, bacterial intertrigo, flexural psoriasis. Hele Hele disease and flexural derriere disease. Management. The first line specific topical therapy is azoles or polyene cream, usually continued for two weeks, but treatment may re be required for a long period. In some patients with moist Canada intertrigo, potassium permanganate soaks are very effective. In finger and toe web infections, topical antifungal therapy combined with use of open footwear is an appropriate management strategy. Then vulvovaginal candidiosis. This condition affects around 75% women of childbearing age and present with itching and soreness with thick, creamy, wide discharge. So patient present with leucoria. Most have no evidence of underlying disease. It is more common in pregnancy and in sexually active female. Recent deficiencies in interleukin-22 and IDO-1 gene product have been associated 
with susceptibility of recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. Typically, there is dusty red erythema of the vaginal mucosa and the vulval skin with curdy white flecks of discharge, but on occasion, the only sign is erythema. The rash may extend onto the perineum and into the groin. Perianal area is often effective, and in extensive cases, subcorneal pustule may be seen at the periphery. So you can see the genital erythema, mucosal erythema, and white curd like pseudomembrane as we see in oral mucosa. The differential diagnosis of leucoria and vulvovaginal candidiasis include trichomonas infection, although it produces watery brown discharge, while candidiasis produces creamy white discharge. Then bacterial vulvovaginitis, <clears throat> psychological leucoria in pregnancy, and the dermatosis affecting the vulva, for example, psoriasis, contact dermatitis, and lichen sclerosis. Disease course and prognosis. Candidal vulvovaginitis may become recurrent, and in around 5% of women, it appears to be a chronic condition. In chronic cases, vaginal mucosa may become glazed and atrophic. There may be considerable vaginal soreness or irritation, as well as dyspareunia. Management. Most cases, clearance of organism is not achieved by standard course of antifungal therapy. If associated with AIDS, infection is quite resistant to therapy. Acute vulvovaginitis can be treated by single dose of topical preparation, pessary or ovules such as clotrimazole, econazole or isoconazole. The longer course of these compounds, that is 14 days, as well as polyene such as nistatin is also available. However, single day oral therapy with fluconazole 150 mg is widely available and both effective and convenient. Itraconazole 600 mg is an alternate. There is no reliable method of curing recurrent vaginal candidosis. Candida balanitis. Skin of glands, penis, especially the uncircumscribed men may sometimes be colonized with candida asymptomatically. When candida balanitis develops, it is usual to find either the abundant vaginal candida carriage or frank vulvovaginitis in the sexual partners. And it is characterized by transient tiny papules and pustules on the glands penis a few hours after the intercourse and rupture leaving a peeling edge. There is little soreness or irritation, and involvement of groin sometimes exists. Differential diagnoses include bacterial balanitis, herpes simplex, flexural psoriasis, erosive lichen planus, plasma cell balanitis, erythroplasia of curat, and lichen sclerosis. So, in balanitis, node erythema with erosion and small, tiny, white pustule at the margin of the lesion. Management. Balanitis usually responds satisfactorily to topical antifungal applied several times a day. If there is a source of infection in sexual partner, this should be treated appropriately and in case of diabetes, the required management. Conjugal cases need simultaneous uh, and often prolonged therapy. Then perineal candidosis of infancy. The most prevalent in the skin affecting the nappy nappies rash. In some instances, the classical subcorneal pustule, a fringed irregular border and satellite lesions are found. Steroid creams applied to this site not only modify the clinical features, but they are probably advantages to candida. Moreover, if bacterial flora have been suppressed by topical antibiotics, this will also favor the yeast growth. Management. Topical antifungal should be combined with general regimen for napkin dermatitis with frequently nappy change. You can see this diaper dermatitis which is super adequately infected by candida. 
the nodular or granulomatous kenidosis of the napkin area also known as the granuloma gluteal infantum a rare condition present with eruption over the buttock and genitals upper thigh and pubis within which develop nodules sometimes as large as 2 cm across these are bluish or brownish in color the lesion develop due to application of steroids to treat the diaper candidiasis histological changes are those of intense inflammatory dermal infiltrate with lymphos eosinophil and histocytes the successful management involves removal of the microorganisms and the avoidance of topical steroids and general measures to ensure adequate dryness in that feature so you can see the granuloma gluteal infantum in this slide the two of these then candidosis of the nail peronychium candida peronychium is a candidal infection of the nail fold candida species not always candida albicans can be isolated from the majority of cases bacteria or irritant or allergic contact dermatitis also play a role the condition is chiefly found among those whose hands hands are frequently immersed in water for example housewives chefs and pastry cooks presence of organic debris such as flour and other carbohydrates aggravate the condition the toe nail folds are not usually affected then typically several fingers are chronically infected the nail fold is red and swollen and though there is loss of cuticle and detachment of nail fold from the dorsal surface of the nail plate leading to pocketing occasionally thick white pus may be discharged the patient usually has marked tenderness nail dystrophy with buckling of nail plate and some discoloration and onycholysis frequently occur so this is candidal peronychia you can see the swelling and redness of the uh, of the nail fold management the candida peronychia requires prolonged topical therapy with frequent applications of polyene simetazoles and non specific remedies like 4% thymol in chloroform lesion uh, lesions are properly preferred over creams it has been few studies of either itraconazole or fluconazole in oral form treatment must be followed by general measures such as ensuring adequate drying of the hands the irritant or allergic contact dermatitis may also play a role in ongoing inflammatory response for this reason chronic cases addition of topical corticosteroid is a logical approach then candida onychomycosis the candida onychomycosis is infection of nail plate caused by candida species this is not as common as candidal peronychia the two important predisposing conditions are raynaud's and cushing syndrome main clue that yeast is significant pathogen are the erosions of the distal nail plate there are three main manifestations of candida infection of the nail apparatus the most common is distal and lateral subungual onychomycosis which is associated with peronychia there can be complete destruction of nail plate with uh, some seen in some patient of chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis you can see the complete destruction of nail plate with prominent peronychia and very rarely candida may invade the nail plate in the neonatal period causing isolated nail dystrophy with evidence of penetration of the superior aspect of the nail plate Candida is not infrequently isolated from under surfaces of nail plate in patient with onycholysis resulting from other causes. The management in proven candida onychomycosis, fluconazole or itraconazole produce the best result. Then comes the congenital candidiasis. Factors associated with this condition. have included the prematurity and presence of intrauterine foreign body usually a contraceptive device it is believed to follow contamination of the skin surface during birth 
and high incidence of intrauterine infection or vaginal candidosis. The amniotic fluid is turbid at delivery. Skin lesions are typically discrete vesicles or pustules on erythematous base. Face and chest are first affected by the rash, which generally spread over the next few days after delivery. In over 10%, there is evidence of the spread to the deep side such as the lung. There has been a high level of mortality reported with such cases. The cause of death is usually related to other complications of prematurity rather than candidosis per se. And candidosis of skin present at birth. Topical therapy alone is required, but where there is systemic involvement, clearly amphotericin B or propanosol should be considered. Then comes genital allergy. Canidal, canida allergy. The, in normal subject, skin testing for canida antigens and serological studies may reveal the evidence of antibodies to canida albicans and other canida species. A variety of clinical features are attributed to canidal allergy and which include urticaria, ordinary annular erythema, bullous annular erythema, and generalized pruritus. Even palmoplantar pustulosis are linked to delayed hypersensitivity to Canada allergy. The term Canada allergy or Canada syndrome is also used to describe the constellation of symptoms ranging from headache to malaise and depression, allegedly secondary to colonization of GI tract with the yeast. Then comes an important topic that is chronic mucocutaneous candidiosis. The persistent candida infection of mouth, skin, nail that is refractory to conventional therapy is a distinct clinical pattern of infection and sometimes it is associated with a variety of other infections both cutaneous and systemic. Many cases form a part of autoimmune polyendocrinopathy. In these patients, mucosal candidosis is usually overshadowed by other serious infections such as recurrent pneumonia or aspergillosis. In some patients with this syndrome develop other infections, most commonly warts, dermatophytosis, and other infections, non-infections like recurrent abscesses, boric dermatitis, and alopecia areata. Another differentiating feature of chronic mucocutaneous candidiosis is the development of infection early childhood. The different type of uh, chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis are the autosomal recessive type. It usually starts in first decade and per with persistent oral and nail plate infection. Generally, health of patient is good and they do not show endocrine defects and tend to improve with advancing age. While the autosomal dominant chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis is more severely affected than other infections and other infections such as dermatophytes may be particularly troublesome. You can see this skin and oral findings. Then idiopathic chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis is a useful subgroup to describe the most severely affected patients who may have other infections and often develop bronchial cases and pulmonary bullying. Candidosis is usually very severe and esophageal involvement in appearance of candida grandum. Then, chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis with associated endocrinopathies. Most of these patients have familial polyendocrinopathy syndrome and is seen in usually in early childhood. Main cluster of endocrine abnormality is hypoparathyroidism with hypoadrenocortism. In addition, other autoimmune abnormalities such as pernicious anemia with ligo ovarian failure may also be seen 
and condition is inherited also as autosomal recessive condition and severity of patient candidosis is variable the fifth and last type is late onset chronic mucopenous candidosis occasionally adult patients found to have the syndrome associated with thymoma patient with systemic lupus erythematosus occasionally develop severe nail changes and oral manifestations to date variety of defects of delayed hypersensitivity are shown to be important but defects in phagocytosis of killing by both macrophages and polymorphs are the most likely cause you can again see the chronic nail infections the pearlish and chronic oral manifestation clinical features with minor variation the syndrome consists of the following features starting in infancy or early childhood persistent oral thrush responding only partially to conventional therapy or relapse prominently treat or promptly after apparently successful treatment chronic hypertrophic changes may follow then cutaneous candidosis often the intertrigenous scan is involved but also the face and the hands and sometimes condition is widespread on trunk and limb in some patients markedly thickened areas with gross hyperkeratosis may form and scalp involvement is not rare in this syndrome the peronychia is often extensive nail plate invasion and total dystrophic onychomycosis important finding of nail invasion is at early age often presenting with complete nail involvement the nail plate is thickened and whole terminal phalanx become encased in hypertrophic infected tissue the seborrheic dermatitis can be very persistent in some patients alopecia areata vitiligo and other organ specific inflammation such as keratitis may be seen with polyendocrinopathy the diagnosis of this condition normally require elapse of time that is it should start early repeated failure to respond to conservative treatment so the main stay of diagnosis is the early onset and poor response to the treatment a family history is obviously important and special note should be taken of other infections cutaneous or systemic and full endocrine investigations are often indicated management treatment of condition depends on anti fungal chemotherapy attempts are made to resolve restore the t cell function by use of transfer factor thymosin grafting compatible lymphocytes from blood or marrow grafting fetal thymic tissue and non specific measures such as restoration of normal normal iron stores when these are defective the systemic anti candida therapy with fluconazole itraconazole or voraconazole is usually necessary and treatment has to be prolonged and repeated once remission is induced maintenance therapy should be avoided where possible in view of the risk of anti fungal resistance attention must be given to treating endocrine deficiencies such as treat, such treatment does not lead to although such treatment does not lead to improvement in candidosis where appropriate parents should be given genetic counseling about the disease so this comes to the end of the chapter sorry end of this lecture and i hope to see you next time with another topic from the same chapter of the fungal infections goodbye and have a good day